I should start my talk by telling you that in the low bar, there's a link to a PDF with links to many of the materials I'll be referring to in this talk, including video clips. The inspiration for this talk came to me a few months ago. I was enjoying a cigar and a double single malt in the main library of my summer residence, Buchanan Castle, near Loch Lomond in Scotland. I purchased the castle in 2013 with the royalties from my first five international bestsellers. Two Men in a Car. The Fraud of the Rings. David and Goliath. The Glass Ceiling Delusion. And of course, my number one bestseller, Feminism, The Ugly Truth. Since 2013, I spent millions of pounds having the castle restored to its former glory. You'll find an entry on the castle on Wikipedia, although the editors seem unaware that it's been fully restored. But then Wikipedia is usually unreliable when it comes to MRAs and other critics of feminism and feminists. My own Wikipedia page was started by a feminist who goes by the name The Vintage Feminist, and there's no mention of Buchanan Castle on the page. Anyway, in my library, I stumbled across a book I first read many years ago. Men are better than women. It was written by Dick Masterson, an American, and published in 2008. It's a gem. I'll just read the start of the back cover text to give you a flavour of the content. Through a process of exhausting man research he calls keeping his eyes open, Dick Masterson has compiled a magnum-sized list of the ways men are better than women. It is an infallible compendium of man's greatness. Filled with the most egregiously fallacious arguments ever put to words, but with some kind of miraculous, rock-solid man logic dripping like motor oil from every sentence. The book has a famous proverb at the start to set the tone. Female anger is the weather vane of truth. Wise words, I think we can all agree. In a similar vein, we must never forget Paul Elam's observation. A key measure of a man's character and mental health is his readiness to say no to women. In this talk, I'll be showing that women consistently fail to compete successfully with men, especially at the highest levels. I'll be mansplaining why women fail and why they always will, unless they're advantaged and men disadvantaged, in which case women aren't competing with men in any adult sense of the word. Women have enjoyed equality of opportunity in the West for over half a century, and still they cannot compete with men. I recently made an important decision, which I'm publicly revealing for the first time in this video. The only person I've confided my decision to is Elizabeth Hobson, the estimable leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them, and she's very supportive of my decision. I've decided it's time for everyone in the men's rights movement and beyond to stop pretending that women will ever compete successfully with men. The 50-year-long social experiment of intersexual competition is over and the results are in. Women failed to compete successfully with men and we now understand why that is and why they will always fail. End of. So women can be relieved of the silly expectation that they can compete with men, which should reduce their stress levels and make them happier than they currently are, which can only be a good thing for both men and women. One of the few female writers whose work I enjoy reading is Faye Weldon, now 89. In 2008, her book, What Makes a Woman Happy, was published. And on the first page, she writes this. The brutal answer to what makes women happy is nothing, not for more than 10 minutes at a time. End of extract. It's simply not down to men to make women happy because that's an impossible demand. It's down to women to work out how to be happy. Now we're constantly told that women are strong and amazing, 
So that shouldn't be too difficult for them. Historically, most people have been reluctant to point out the obvious realities of intersex competitiveness to women, preferring not to challenge their fragile egos and therefore upset their delicate feelings. It was a reluctance rooted in gynocentrism which comes to these conferences to die. There will be no gynocentrism in this talk and I'll be drawing on an important research paper written by a team of British psychologists ironically led by a female psychologist. One major reason women fail to compete with men is sex differences in work ethic. In the year 2000, Catherine Hackim, a world-renowned British sociologist, published a paper on what she termed preference theory, and it's covered in her book, Work Lifestyle Choices in the 21st Century. Her research uncovered that four in seven British men are work-centred, but only one in seven British women are. Six out of seven women, in other words, would prefer, given the opportunity, to engage in little or no paid employment. This four to one work ethic ratio obviously has major implications. A few years ago, a survey of British women carried out for the Fawcett Society, a leading feminist propaganda outfit, found that fewer than one in 10 of women self-identified as feminists. But feminists are wildly overrepresented in setting and influencing public policy, and they're responsible for driving women out of the home and making them engage in far more paid employment than they would otherwise do, given a free choice. We now have solid evidence for the long suspected causal link between feminists' increasing influence and women's increasing unhappiness over the past 50 years, thanks to research by a team of crack sociologists by which I mean expert sociologists, not sociologists who smoke crack. The team was led by Professor Ethel Murray of the University of Swindon, one of only two non-feminist sociology professors in the UK, the other being Eric Anderson, an American professor of sport, health and social sciences at the University of Winchester. Eric is talking about brain injury as a men's issue at this conference. Feminist academics are doing all in their power to have Professor Murray's report taken down from the internet. So I urge you to Google the keywords Ethel Murray, University of Swindon, before the report is taken down. I'll explain why advancing women over better qualified men, whether through gender quotas or otherwise, inevitably leads to declines in performance and higher costs. The declines in performance are seen following increases in the proportion of women in professions and in the senior levels of organisations. There are, of course, a very few exceptional women who can compete successfully against men at a high level in some areas, but their numbers are so minuscule they cannot possibly justify the large-scale, costly programmes advancing women at the expense of better qualified men, which we see in many professions and in the senior levels of organisations. I will illustrate the three Buchanan's laws of intersexual competition with real-world examples. My first law is this. Where merit is judged objectively, women fail to compete successfully with men. Almost the only exceptions to this law are female men's rights activists and anti-feminists, who are all both intelligent and beautiful, as many people have observed. Obvious examples include Belinda Brown, Professor Janice Fiamengo, Karen Strawn and Elizabeth Hobson, the current leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them, which I founded and led until six months ago. Women sometimes claim there are areas where merit is ju judged objectively and women outcompete men, but I've never found a claim which stood up to serious examination. And so what if there were a few such areas? The number would be dwarfed by the countless areas where men outcompete women, so my first law would remain valid. I'll start with physical sports, in part because that's where intersexual competition is at its most absurd and hilarious, and therefore provides material for my website laughingatfeminists.com. Let's be honest, the most you can say about women's soccer is that it's a cure for insomnia. 
But it's also a sport that many lesbians seem to enjoy playing and watching, along with women's rugby. Some lesbians could benefit from engaging more in sporting activities. I think we can all agree. This brings me to the Matildas, the Australian women's soccer team. In 2016, the Matildas represented their country's best chance of an Olympic medal in soccer, and they were then ranked fifth in the world by FIFA. These women were claimed to be supreme athletes who had played and competed their entire lives to work their way to the elite level they were on at the time. They were paid well for what they did, and it was said they literally ate, slept and breathed soccer. An example of the ridiculous hyperbole that's often used with regards to women in general and sportswomen in particular. But they did certainly benefit from some of the best coaches, trainers, sports physicians, sports psychologists and physiotherapists in the world. In May 2016, in preparation for an upcoming international friendly against Greece, the Matildas were pitched against a team of 14 and 15 year old boys uh, from a small school in Newcastle, New South Wales. The boys won 7-0. I can only assume that their mothers and maybe their teachers asked them not to go past the 10 or 20 goal marks. It's always unwise for women to compete against men, and even boys, in sports. And in 2019 we had a vivid reminder of why that is in the World Athletics Championships held in Doha. Some genius had come up with the idea of mixed 4x400 metre relay competitions. There were seven national teams with two male runners and two female. In the final, all the teams but one used the runner sequence man, woman, woman, man. The exception was Poland. The coach of the Polish team, surely a misogynist, decided to use the sequence man, man, woman, woman. Hmm, how might that have turned out? Hmm. The event organisers declined my request to include clips from the video footage in my talk, so you'll need to go to the PDF for a link to the video and the times of the key extracts. Long story short, in the final leg of the race, the Polish woman started with a lengthy lead over the six men starting the leg, maybe 80 to 100 metres. Four of the six men beat her to the finishing line. Comedy gold. And it's on my comedy channel. I turn now to fields in which strength is of no consequence, but there's still no doubt who the winners and losers are. On the sports front, we need only look at snooker. Rianne Evans, 35, is an English snooker player and the reigning world women's snooker champion. She's won the women's world title a record 12 times, with 10 consecutive titles between 2005 and 14, and further wins in 2016 and 19. She's ranked number one on the World Women's Snooker Tour. Evans received a wild card to play on the main professional snooker tour during the 2010-11 season, but was unable to retain her place, which wasn't an earned place anyway, being a wild card, on the professional tour for subsequent seasons. In 2013, she qualified for the Wuzi Classic as an amateur competitor, becoming the first woman ever to reach the final stages of a ranking snooker tournament. She received a wild card to the qualifying rounds of the World Snooker Championship in 2015 and from 2017 to 20. Her, her best performance was reaching the second qualifying round in 2017 by defeating Robin Hull, for whom you have to feel very sorry. This made her the first and so far only woman ever to win a World Championship match. Women are similarly non-existent or close to non-existent at the top level in other sports not requiring physical strength. They include darts, where again women enter competitions with men after receiving wild cards, but they're soon eliminated by the men, usually in the first round. But let's move on from sports, what about intellectual competitions? Do women compete with men any more successfully there, where merit can be objectively determined? No. Chess may be an obvious example, which brings us to Judith Polgar, a Hungarian woman now 44 years old. 
She's generally considered the strongest female chess player of all time, although she's been inactive since 2015. Women's work ethic, eh? After lengthy coaching from some top players, all of them men obviously, she achieved the title of Grandmaster at the age of 15, the youngest ever player to break into the International Chess Federation. She's the only woman to have ever qualified for a World Championship tournament, having done so in 2005. Her world ranking peaked that year at number 8. She's the only woman to have won a game against a reigning world number 1 player, Anatoly Karpov, in 1998, but that was in action chess, where games must be completed in under 30 minutes. What about other intellectual competitions? The story is the same wherever you look. BBC Radio 4 has run the Brain of Britain competition every year since 1954. Of the 62 winners whose sex is obvious from their names, 56 have been men. University Challenge has been screened on TV every year since 1962. The format is two teams of four players competing, usually university students, but there are variations in the format. Women very rarely excel in University Challenge, but the low point for them surely came last year when the teams consisted of university alumni. The captain of the Reading University team was Sophie Walker, at the time the leader of the Women's Equality Party. In the final, she earned the distinction of being the captain of the only team in the programme's 58 years history to win no points, losing 240 points to nil. Again, comedy gold. Virtually all the winning team's points were won by men, and more than half of them by one man alone. Sophie Walker's team would have fared no worse if she and the other team members had all been replaced with bricks. I turn now to Buchanan's second law of intersexual competition. Where merit is judged subjectively, where women appear to compete successfully with men, it's because of manipulation and the corruption of processes. Examples include the awarding of prizes and the appointments of people to positions. I'll illustrate my second law with reference to men and women in the arts. Two other speakers at this conference are speaking about the sexes in the arts, and both are artists, Alexander Adams and Alan Deadman. Alan's video includes footage of his friend David Cockney, a forthright artist. Alan trained at the Royal Academy of Arts, where Tracy Emin, oh, sorry, where Tracy Emin, was appointed to the post of Professor of Drawing, despite the minor handicap of being unable to draw. Both Dedman and Cockney have some insightful things to say about Emin's art. In this photograph, Miss Emin is wearing a t-shirt sold by the Fawcett Society. I'm not sure if she's trying to smile. It looks to me like she may have been suffering from severe constipation that day, which would be ironic given that she's a pain in the arts. This brings me to the literary world and book prizes, specifically the Booker Prize for Fiction. In 2019, the chair of the judging panel was Peter Florence, an unfortunate surname there for a man, while the four judges were all women, Liz Calder, Jean-Lu Guo, Afua Hirsch and Joanna McGregor. Two prize winners were selected, something not allowed in the Booker Prize rules. Both the winners were women. What are the chances? Who can take seriously female winners of prizes in the arts? Not me. I turn now to Buchanan's third law of intersexual competition. Preferencing women over men in professions and organisations leads to declines in performance and increases in costs. I shall demonstrate my law with reference to the worlds of education, medicine, politics and the world of work in general. Education illustrates the point that women fail to perform as well as men at the individual and group level, and the result is predictable. William Collins is the British blogger behind the influential blog The Illustrated Empathy Gap, and the author of the international bestseller The Empathy Gap, Male Disadvantages and the Mechanisms of Their Neglect, published last year by LPS Publishing, the world's leading publisher of books by men's rights activists 
and other anti-feminists. I'll be drawing on Collins's book in the section on education, and I recommend you check out his website on the issue of education and so much more besides. I'll start with the issue of girls outperforming boys in secondary education and beyond. Across the Western world, more women attend university than men, and this has been the case for many years. In the UK, we need to go back to the 1987-88 academic year for an understanding of the roots of the issue. That was the year that O-levels were replaced by GCSEs, which allowed for more continuous assessment and therefore enabled teachers' pro-girl bias to be reflected in grades. It's a widely held but erroneous belief that boys did consistently better than girls in O-levels, theories for which included boys being allegedly better equipped to handle the stress of the examination process, which in itself said something about um, female anxiety, I think. Anyway, we turn to a diagram in Collins's book. We can see from the diagram not only that boys and girls did equally well prior to the introduction of GCSEs in 1987-88, but the girls did markedly better from that year onwards. The education gender gap has continued to this day. The worst performing cohort of pupils has been working class boys for many years, and I know of only two politicians campaigning for this to be addressed. Philip Davis and Ben Bradley, both Conservative MPs. The current Conservative government, which has a strong majority, is showing zero interest in addressing the issue. I turn to the issue of the increasing proportion of school teachers who are female and the resulting disappearance of male teachers, which has had very predictable consequences. We turn to another diagram in Collins's book. You will notice the steep declines in the percentages of male teachers and male head teachers in both primary and secondary schools, with pupils spanning the age of 5 to 18 over the years 1970 to 2018, very nearly half a century. Before 1970, pupils had to sit the 11 plus examination at the end of their primary years to determine which types of school they would later attend. To illustrate whether educational standards have declined in the UK since 1970, I'll turn to Simon Webb, a British historian who only recently published a video on his History Debunked YouTube channel titled, Have Educational Standards in Britain Declined? He compared maths questions in an 11 plus paper in a pre-1970 examination with the GCSE maths examination for 16 year olds in 2014. It's worth noting that calculators were not commercially available before 1970, so they couldn't have been available to pupils taking the 11 plus. Pupils could and did use them for the GCSE exams in 2014. I would invite you to freeze the video and attempt the four questions without the use of a calculator. I don't think we can doubt the decline in educational standards after 1970, coinciding with the disappearance of male teachers. But what about the efficiency and cost effectiveness of the school system since 1970? Before the disappearance of male teachers, one teacher would control the class. As the men disappeared, classes increasingly required two teachers, a woman and an assistant. And of course the assistant was almost always a woman too. In 2013, one county alone in England reported that it had spent more than 100 million pounds, that's about 125 million US dollars, over four years on, te on teaching assistants. The annual cost of teaching assistants in the UK is enormous, and of course mainly paid by, by male taxpayers, who pay almost three quarters of income tax. The bottom line? It takes two women to educate children less well than one man can, and it costs a lot more money. Men are discriminated against in the higher education sector by a scheme called Athena Swan, which forces universities to positively discriminate on behalf of women who are usually less qualified than the best available men for academic positions. I refer you to William Collins's website, 
the illustrated empathy gap, and again his book, The Empathy Gap, for, for more details on this deplorable scheme. I'll say a few words about medicine. In the 1970s, Vernon Coleman, the first TV doctor in the UK, revealed that medical schools were preferencing women over men for medical degree courses. That has continued to this day, and for years about two-thirds of medical students have been women. As Coleman predicted, the women are far more likely than, than the men not to practice medicine after graduating, often because they've bagged a fellow student as a future husband, and to work part-time rather than full-time, even if they have no children. Women avoid demanding specialisms such as A&E um, and work, working on social hours, preferring instead to become GPs in particular. Everything that Coleman predicted has come to pass, and the National Health Service is today even more of a disaster than you'd expect of a 75-year-old state-owned virtual monopoly. It's been estimated that female medical graduates will work on average half the hours over their careers compared with their male colleagues. Put another way, two women need to be trained as doctors to work the same hours over a career as one man. The inevitable consequences include a huge waste of taxpayers' money on funding the expensive training of women doctors and a fall in doctor numbers which has led to the need to employ huge numbers of doctors who've trained overseas usually from poor countries which can ill afford to lose them, such as India and Pakistan. A few final words on medicine. You may or may not be aware that Florence Nightingale, that great British heroine of nursing, implemented measures in our, in our hospital during the Crimean War, which led directly to the otherwise avoidable deaths of thousands of injured British soldiers. I'll put a link in the low bar to a short video on the matter. So what did the British government decide to call the huge new temporary critical care hospitals for COVID-19 sufferers? Nightingale hospitals. This leads me to the world of politics. A number of British political parties, most notably the Labour Party, have long used all women shortlists for selecting parliamentary candidates. More than half the Labour MPs today are women, yet curiously the party does not intend to introduce all men shortlists. Vince Cable stated proudly to an inquiry that the party he led at the time, the Liberal Democrats, used all women shortlists in winnable seats. I can only assume that for unwinnable seats, the party used all men shortlists. When these women were duly and predictably elected, because male turkeys do a vote for Christmas, and very reliably, they always turn out to be hopeless MPs with no grasp of just how woeful they are. This brings me inevitably to the Labour MP Jess Phillips. A few months after her election as an MP in 2015, she was sitting as a member of the Backbench Business Committee. Among other things, the committee allocates time for debates. The Conservative MP Philip Davis, who spoke at two of the previous ICMIs and is speaking at this one, was seeking time for a debate on men's issues, the first such debate in commemoration of International Men's Day. A video of the exchanges between Jess Phillips and Philip Davis is on the YouTube channel of the political party Justice for Men and Boys. This was their final exchange. I don't care about men's issues, it's that I'm hoping for parity myself. Here, here. I absolutely care about men's issues. And when I've got parity, and when women in this, this, these buildings have parity, you can have your debate. Oh, Mr Chairman, can I, if, I can just, if I can just make the point... And that, that will take a, an the, awfully the, long the, time. The, 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 I'm not requesting a debate on representation within the House of Commons. I'm asking for debates on men's issues. And, and the list of issues I gave earlier, I would like to think people can recognise are genuine issues and actually a very, very rarely debated in the House of Commons, very rarely debated in the House of Commons. Right. Well, thank you very much for it. Thank you very much indeed. Jess Phillips's intervention led to such strong objections that Philip Davis was later permitted to host the debate, and he's hosted the debate every year since then, covering many men's issues, including domestic abuse, suicide, and MGM. In interviews, Jess Phillips has frequently admitted to having a major anxiety disorder to the extent that when her sons are late home from school, she assumes they are dead. 
Yet after the Labour Party, with its leader Jeremy Corbyn, a communist, lost the 2019 general election, Phillips made a bid to become the party leader and in due course a potential prime minister. Resilience is surely an important quality in a prime minister. Because of Phillips' sheer stupidity, narcissism, lack of resilience and self-knowledge, the UK faced the prospect of a radical feminist prime minister with a major anxiety disorder, making such decisions as whether to go to war or employ, or employ nuclear weapons. Good grief. Um, excuse me a moment. Hello, anti-feminist hotline. You have, thank you. You have photographs of Harriet Harman MP and Jess Phillips MP holding hands in Parliament Square, looking up at the Millicent Fawcett statue. Y yes, please do email the images to me. We can certainly use them. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm currently uh, in the middle of recording um, a conference video. Um, with the international um, film director Tom Caulfield, so um, his his time is very expensive, as as you as you can imagine. Um, so if you could call back in an hour, that would be great. I'll I'll take your call then. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. I turn now to other fields of employment. Over many years, countless men's careers have been crippled, as less qualified women have been promoted ahead of them. Since 2011, FTSE 100 companies have been appointing poorly qualified women to their boards and other senior positions because of the government's threat of legislative gender quotas, and more recently the FTSE 350 started down the same crazy path. The broader issue of women on boards has interested me since before I launched Campaign for Merit in Business in 2012, and in November of that year I gave evidence to a House of Commons inquiry. The video of that is on the Justice for Men and Boys website. The campaign was then, and remains to this day, the only campaign in the English-speaking world challenging initiatives to increase the proportion of women on corporate boards because of the overwhelming evidence from longitudinal studies of a causal link with corporate performance decline. The government is fully aware of that evidence, but continues to press major companies to appoint more women to their boards anyway. There's a great deal of material on these issues on the Campaign for Merit in Business website. I turn now to a couple of remarkable articles about CEOs. They are written by an American, August Levensky Old, and published on the influential American website avoiceformen.com in 2017. I should explain that the S&P 500 is the list of the 500 largest companies listed on stock exchanges in the United States. The first article was titled, Women Hate Being CEOs and They Suck At It. His key findings were these. In 2012, 20 S&P 500 companies had female CEOs. By 2017, 10 of the women were no longer CEOs. By 2017, all the female CEOs companies had fallen in the S&P rankings. His second article was also about male and female CEOs of S&P 500 companies over 2012 and showed how the rankings of their companies had changed over the space of five years. The article was titled, Do Men Make Better CEOs Than Women? His key findings were these. 15 of the 20 men still held their titles after five years, compared to just 10 of the 20 women. Eight of the 15 men improved the rankings of their company, compared to none of the 10 women. Final result, men at plus 451 were 994 ranks higher than comparable women CEOs, who scored minus 443. This wasn't just the slaughter of women CEOs. This was Bambi meets Godzilla. There's a link to, to, to those articles on the Campaign for Merit in Business website. This brings me to the issue of why women fail to compete successfully with men at the highest levels. Susan Pinker is a psychologist and newspaper columnist hailing from Canada 
and the sister of the Harvard psychology professor Stephen Pinker. Her book, The Sexual Paradox, published in 2008, explained that the small number of women at the top of major organisations could be explained in large part by women's freely made choices, but of course feminists rejected that explanation, sticking with their usual baseless conspiracy theories, invariably rooted in their myth that men are misogynistic and discriminate against men in the workplace and elsewhere. Now, it would clearly be in everyone's interest to stop pretending that women are the equals of men when it comes to high-level competition. I turn to Dr. Victoria Bateman, a psychologist at the University of Swindon. For over a year, she's been leading a team of psychologists examining competition between the sexes. The design of the study is fascinating, I think. The team generated a list of traits and issues which they thought might impact on the competitive success of men and women in intersexual competition. They then phone interviewed at random a selection of 100 men and women, 50 of each in their 50s and 60s, of an age with good experience of how the world really works. They asked them which sex would tend to benefit competitively from each trait and issue. The paper is currently undergoing peer review prior to publication, which is expected early in 2021. We can only hope that feminists with whom academia and academic journal publishers are riddled, do not prevent the publication of the paper. Dr. Bateman was kind enough to allow me to reveal the traits and issues the team examined in their study, and she initially asked me to present them only as bullet points before the paper's publication. But she, said, but she later sent me an email asking me to make a number of points before presenting the traits and issues in this talk. Number one. The relevance of individual traits and issues is dependent on the nature of the competition. Number two, the traits and issues range from biological to cultural and include human characteristics. Some might generally be regarded as positive qualities, others negative, while some qualities may be negative in everyday life but helpful in terms of competitiveness. Next point. The extent to which individual traits and issues advantage one sex over the other varies widely. Sometimes it's considerable, sometimes it's nuanced. Where a trait or, or issue disadvantages one sex, the other sex is thereby advantaged. This is a zero-sum game. Many of the traits and issues become more relevant as the level of co competition increases. And in the world of work, they become more relevant as organisational size increases. The traits and issues are more relevant for private sector organisations, where merit is judged more objectively because of the pro profit imperative, than in the public sector. Her final point was that the issues are considered in the cultural context of the UK, and the findings of such studies may differ in other cultures. Dr Bateman is, a, is of the view, however, that the findings would be similar in all developed countries and possibly in developing countries too. We'll start with a list of traits and issues where, where more of the respondents believed men were advantaged. Then we'll go on to the list of traits and issues where more of them believed women were advantaged. Strap yourselves in, these lists may be longer than you'd expect.
There's very little there that any reasonable person would dispute. I think we can all agree. Feminists are excluded by definition, being unreasonable hatchet-faced harpies who suffer from feminist derangement syndrome. We now turn to the list of traits and issues which advantage women over men. To be honest, aren't we already aware of the impact of most of these traits and issues? It's only because we pander, pander to women's feelings that we don't admit it both publicly and privately. We must stop that pandering starting now. Thank you for listening to my talk. And remember, laughing at feminists and other ridiculous women is more than important. It's a civic duty.